Okay. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, what's motivating what I'm talking about here is I, I have had to give lectures on stuff which is not my stuff, a lot of stuff on GFF and, and couplings. And um, I try when lecturing on stuff to try to learn it first. In this case, I, I, I struggled to learn parts of it. And as I tried to redo some of it, I a lot, a lot of it's redoing, but sometimes got a little bit novel at times, the way that I was doing it. So I like to represent uh, my way of doing this. So for the experts, think of this as pedagogical and, and or a di different approach slightly. For newcomers in this area, the idea is this also could be a, an, an introduction to, to the relationship. So I, and I don't know, and I think a lot of people in this field, in, in this room, are somewhere between those two things. So I have no idea how to judge. <laughs> okay. Um, now a little bit, of, I'm actually going to start with a slide for experts, uh, just because so, so that they will know differences in my notation from other, from other things. Okay. Uh, for those who know me and SLD, I always like the parameter A, which is um, two over kappa. Oh, there we go, two over kappa. Um, I'll have the Dirichlet Green's function so, uh, on a domain. So I have parameter uh, coefficient one here on my Green's function everywhere. Some people have a different constant there. And the next order term is the log conformal radius. And I've got the habit of calling it log conformal radius, even if it's a non simply connected domain. I just conformal radius, but I don't know another name for it besides the formal radius, but the, the next correction of the Green's function. So that's that's in a domain, or sometimes the whole plane one will be again coefficient one. Um, I don't like complicated things in my ex exponents. So I'm actually what I'm gonna do is uh, well, first, okay, I'll say here, gamma, I Gamma is a curve in all of my stuff. I cannot use gamma as a parameter. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I don't need to for all I'm talking about today. So if for everything I think about, think of gamma as being square root cap over two. And I just use cap as the parameter. Or square root cap. That, that's for length, length measure. That's if we're going to area measure. Just, just, just think that. Um, and then my GFF, I'll call it my GFF kappa which means multiplying, which is by changing the Green's function by a factor of kappa over four. So GFF kappa naturally goes with SLE kappa. That's it. And so we'll do that. Um, now, actually, when I talk about the GFF, I can, I can have kappa as much bigger than four. The restriction to zero less than kappa less than four comes mainly when we actually have to exponentiate the, the, the GFF. And for those people who like the parameter Q, you're not gonna see that either. So I will have just kappa or A, which is two over kappa and the Green's function. Okay. Um, well, my other part is actually do a lot of discussion of discrete GFF. And I actually have a book out very recently out intended for undergraduates called Random Explorations. And the motivation of this, which is, is that whether you're doing SLE or the Gaussian field a la, uh, well, I guess the first papers were Scott and Odette, and maybe Julianne Dumeda, using SLE to explore a, a field. You can do the same thing for the GF, for the discrete GFF. I take the slightly different approach, which is uh, I kind of think of the Gaussian field not existing until we explore it, rather than thinking the field is there already. It, mathematically, they're equivalent. But well, I'll, I'll, there's okay. So take, take a discrete GFF. Then I have a finite. There's actually there's no reason to restrict to a finite set, but something something less than all of Z two. Take the random walk Green's function, and we then we order the points. So this depends on that. That will be our the the order that we do. At each point, we put an independent Gaussian random variable, standard Gaussian. And, uh, and then the value of the field, 
xk is the expected value of what's happened so far. So, so this is so h like the actually there's really <coughs> hj. So this is we just basically it's it's easier just to draw this in picture. <laughs> We've explored a certain amount. We've seen the field at these points. Now we go to this point and we take a take our Markov chain or a random walk, let it run until it hits the boundary. Take the value of the field at the boundary, the expected value of that. That's the expected value of the field given what you've seen so far. And then you add a, um, and then there's last term, which is an independent normal random variable. Teach regression for, for multi normal uh, Gaussian. The value at a particular point is the expected value given the others plus some extra randomness. And that's, it's all of this is just generalizations of that idea. Um, and so this does this, this gives you, a, so this gives you a Gaussian free field for any Markov chain whose covariance function is the Green's function. In fact, it doesn't have to be a Markov chain. It can be weights, symmetric weights. Has to be, I say any, but it has to be symmetric Markov chain. Any symmetric Markov chain, but you're not, you're actually not restricted to positive weights. You could have negative weights, symmetric, or even comp complex Hermitian symmetric, as long as it's the Green's functions are sufficiently bound. But I'm not, not going to get into that. Um, what I want to do is say, what's what's the analog of this, which is elementary? In if I say if I want to do the Dirichlet GFF in the upper half plane. We can actually take this as a definition of the Dirichlet GFF in the upper half plane. Um, let's start with a curve in H that's plane filling. Okay, you have to convince yourself that you can find a curve that's plane filling. I just said SLE curves for kappa bigger than eight work, but you can just take any plane filling curve in the upper half plane. Just take one. Uh, so taking a curve is the same as ordering the points in A in the discrete case. Take a standard Brownian motion that takes the place of the independent Gaussians. And we want to write the analog of this as just the integral from zero to infinity. The NJs become dWt. This, this is some rate at which you have to add randomness. And this is the some, some appropriate Poisson kernel. Uh, this doesn't quite make sense as written, uh, so we just because because this thing is going to blow up. Uh, maybe I should almost draw the same picture here. I could I could for the continuous case. We've got, okay, I'm just going to draw my curve like that. So there is the beginning of my curve, and now I'm infinitesimally adding. So at, at this point here. I'm infinitesimally adding the value of the field there by um, looking at, well, in this case, this is like um, for looking at where it hits there and adding there. So, um, so if you want to make this precise, the first thing, oops, I'm going the wrong way here. No, I mean, I'm so when you go to the lattice, in the lattice case, it didn't matter what you how you order the points or you no, know, no matter how you order the points, it's the same distribution. That's why life is good. So, like if you've got a multi-normal normal distribution, you can look at one first and then the expected value given that. That's why everything works. It's as simple as that. That's why Gaussians are nice. Um so. To, so in this case, this will not depend on which what curve gamma I choose either. To, um, the first thing to do is to get rid of this term or simplify that. And that's what um, parameterizing by capacity does. So I take my curve and I re-parameterize it so that if I look at, so here are now the, the Lerner maps.
So I'm always going to take Lurvier maps there. Uh, so that's the GT. Uh, these are parameterized, uh, oh, it's chosen. So it, the coefficient at infinity is Z plus, plus zero. And then this next term is how fast I grow. And I choose it to be A. Um, you could think two over kappa whenever you see an A. And so you just do that to your curve, do that to your curve, and then this function GT, its time derivative is given by this. This is the Lerner equation. It's just, it's just a deterministic fact about the curve. Um, and just some notation, uh, when I write ZT of Z, it'll be this denominator, GT of Z minus UT. And one over ZT will come up a lot of that. So I write one over ZT, and I'm going to have the real part and imaginary part of that. And it's useful to put a minus sign in the imaginary part. So if I do this, then this term right here is exactly the term that we get here. I mean, the picture is if I'm here and I want the, you know, I want to look at a Poisson kernel there, I can tap it here and do that. So this guy is just the Poisson kernel in this picture mapped over here. That's all it is. And so then we define phi of z, and that, that t should be an infinity here. Phi of z is just the, just the integral of that. Okay, this is not precise because the stochastic integral blows up. But to a precise definition, this, most people here will know this. If I, if I take a, a compactly supported measure on H such that the corresponding, well, in this case, I, I want the half plane Green's function, G <laughs> half, as long as this is fi as long as this is finite, then I can write the same thing, but instead of saying H T of Z, I have H T of rho just averaged out there. So I can define H T of rho to be the same thing averaged out, V W T. And then you just check V of rho is a center Gaussian random variable with this variance. And you have, so you have, you now that you've defined the GFF kappa as, uh, you do it. And by the definition, you can actually check that the is, is, definition is basically conformally invariant, doesn't depend, doesn't depend on the curve, doesn't do that. Okay. Um, in many cases, the curve you choose is not space filling. If it's not space filling, say a straight line or an SLA kappa kappa less than eight, then I do this, and I do the complete curve, of course. And then the value at this point here is actually well-defined. The integral, because at this point, you now have basically the expected value of the field, knowing the field on the curve. So you then, if you do that, you can get the full field by then adding a Dirichlet field here and a Dirichlet field independently. And basically from statistics 101, 102, I, I've got the habit of calling that extra field that you put in on these cases always the residual field. The residual is, is what you have. You have the expected value that you have a residual. Okay, but now here is the, if we could use any curve gamma. Um, we can also choose a random gamma. By the way, the relationship between gamma and ut is one to one. So the driving function ut and the curve gamma are essentially the same thing here. But I can choose a, a real value from any function, and I can choose a random function. And there's two main cases of random functions that are useful here. One is independent of the field values that we're producing or ones that are strongly dependent on the field values, but do not look to the future. They have to be adaptive. And the GFF SLE coupling, the most basic one, is basically gotten by using the same uh, uh, Brownian motion for the uh, field and producing the curve. 
intuitively, on the discrete, the discrete case, it would be like, discreetly you would go there, you would sample the field someplace, and then look at your value there to make a decision where to sample next. And then look at a value there and make use that to decide. And that's perfectly legitimate as well, as long as you're not looking to the future. So, That is the basic GFF cap, uh, um, the coupling. By the way, this, this, this couples SLE kappa with GFF kappa. There's that, that's because I used A as my uh, rate of parameterization. That's, just, that's how kappa got into this. Uh, let me just, kappa got into this because of that choice there. So I'm choosing UT to be, or WT to be a standard Brownian motion, but A to be two over capital. And therefore, and this is, this is the coupling of SLE capital. This is the sort of imaginary geometry of people wish coupling. But I mean, um, when you couple it, there's a, there's a basic fact, so this is well known to the experts, but maybe not, maybe not with this notation. So if I look at this ZT of Z, this is, Basically, the, the image of Z except normalized so that this point becomes zero. Um, this, this is zero here. Um, and I look at the argument of it. You just do Edo's formula, and you do Edo's formula, and you're, you're careful with your Edo's formula, and you uh, actually see what the Martingale term is. The Martingale term is, is exactly the value of the field at that point. So the, so the argument of where you are plus a correction equals the argument of where you start plus the value of the field on the curve that you've seen. Um, I'll just say at least a cap is less than eight, this guy has a limit and is Non-zero argument, you know, derivatives, this derivative, this is, this is non-trivial here, and it's going to go to infinity. So you can actually go to infinity and write uh, the field as, the, the entire field as this integral, as this plus this, this plus this minus this. And then plus a Dirichlet field on all the parts you that haven't actually been reached by the curve. And if cap is equal to four, so this is so like for cap equals four, this is the basic of of Scott and Oded's paper um, coupling uh, GFF with um, GF with cap with SLE four. And I haven't quite figured out the history of how much credit you should get and how much credit Julianne should get for kappa not equal to four, and I'm not gonna worry about it, it's history. Who, who to credit, you. What's that? I mean, I'm definitely giving you, 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 you how, who, gets, I, who gets the credit for doing this for kappa not equal to four? I mean, so this first worked out in 2003, um, and uh, I don't know, I can tell you more afterwards. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> My guess is it's a subset of Oded, Scott, and Julia. And I don't know where to put the exact. Yeah. Maybe other people as well. Okay. We gave a million talks on this in 2003, four, and five. And Julian was my postdoc, and he wrote a paper in 2007. But he did not claim that he did it first. That was never a. Okay. I. Uh, claim by his. I, I'm terrible with history on these things. Okay, so this is. But I just want to give you the the basic idea of the proof, which is, um, basically, you just there's a deterministic fact that tells you what the derivative of the Green's function is with respect to time. As if I take two point c w as the curve grows, deterministically you get the Green's function. So you get you get the Green's function out there. <laughs> And basically, there's a fact about stochastic integrals. Stochastic integrals are not always normal random variables. But if stochastic integrals, if the final variance you get is deterministic, then it is normal. 
So basically, you do this, if, if it was space filling, you would get uh, the entire Green's function. If it's not space filling, you have to add an independent normal, but then this, you know, this, this, is, this is the residual field being add, added to it. And so that, that's why it works. Um, you would do the same thing with full plane. You have to be a little careful because it's now defined only up to a additive constant. Uh, I, I, I like to do it on the, for the, for me, if you do the full plane, you can uh, first view the whole plane or if you wish the sphere um, by viewing it on the real line. So that's the values on the real line. And then you add Dirichlet's up and down. So <coughs> it's, 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 it's the same idea, but okay. So here's where you get something where, where, I, where there may or may not be something new. Okay, not this page, not this one. Uh, so I'm gonna use the terminology that at least uh, Stanley uses, Neumann GFF in the upper half plane. So start, start with a full plane GFF. And then we, um, add the upper half plane and lower half plane components, divide by square root two. And this is a field which sort of has the, as a distribution of the Gaussian field in the upper half plane, but the boundary values get doubled in some sense. The boundary, the Z and H of Z and H of uh, Z complement are uh, independent if Z and Z bar are, are, are not on the real line, but they are very de dependent if they're on the real line. Um, so what I want to do is write this field as we did before as a field, which is a field on the real line plus the residual field, which is just a Dirichlet GFF, and the, the I, and what I'm going to focus here is on the phi, not on the H tilde, so much. Um, and phi, because it's because it has that doubling, is now rather than being a GFF kappa, is a GFF two kappa, because it, it's sort of like it's like it's two times a random variable divided by square root two which is square root two times the random variable, which multiplies the variance by two. And now what I want to do is describe one way to create this uh, field, which is gonna help understand that when we try to exponentiate. Okay. Um, I say a different way of constructing for capital less than four, a lot, a lot, some of what I'm gonna say will work for capital bigger than four, but. Well, to just think capital lesson for uh, is related to the zipping up procedure. Now, the difference here is that instead of having a, an integral, a stochastic integral with respect to a real Brownian motion, there will be a, inter, a stochastic integral with respect to a complex Brownian motion, which is just two independent real Brownian motions. And roughly speaking, the BT will generate an SLE path and BT star will generate an independent field along the way. Now, in order to describe this, this we, need, we need the notion of the Lerner flow. So the Lerner flow is the backwards Lerner equation, if you wish. Um, and This is where I really want to have some pictures here. So that's time zero, maybe. There's a Z in the upper half plane and time T. And this has gone up to, say, G, I use G. Well, it's Z T of Z if I make this zero. So this is going up as this curve goes up. Uh, 
So at a fixed time t, the this uh, this has the distribution of an SLE kappa, uh, but it doesn't grow the same way that a forward one would grow. Um, that's so I do that. If I start on the real line, then the real line does a, a Bessel process with negative parameter, minus A, until it hits the origin. And then it shoots up. So that's what happens. And the time at which this guy hits the origin, I'm calling it TX. And it has, has a partner over here that has the same, uh, maybe, but there's another guy over here that hits at the same time. And as before, I'm going to write this. And now I'm going to give you the formal field. The form phi of z, this is both on the real line and in the upper half plane, is the real part of 1 over zt dwt. I'm writing it this way, and I'm going to say, I, I'm not sure that I'm trying to say otherwise. One of my questions is, that would be uh, uh, so. I'll say it'd be an obvious question. So I'll answer it now. I have no idea, which is what does the imaginary part of this look like? I do have some. I mean, it's a good question, but it's. I mean, it, but there's the expression. It's if you take the the real part of that, it's two guys like that. So let's let's see what I want to see what's show what's happening here. Let's first start. Oops. <coughs> Uh, let's start, uh, if C is an H, so if C starts out here, then phi of Z is a limit of a phi sub phi T of Z. So I'm just, this is just uh, value. So U T of Z is the, just the integral up to time. This V T is, is the integral of that, is that. Now, these are not independent. The round motions are independent, but the H depends on the curve. So this guy is what's driving the Lerner equation. It's, the, it's that BT. And you could actually write this in terms of values of the Lerner equation. That's just, again, Ito's formula. This Brownian motion is independent, uh, but the H depends on this curve. So, but the quadratic variation between these is zero because the Brownian motions are independent. And therefore, the quadratic variation of this <coughs> is exactly that. And the same kind of argument holds that there's a limiting field. You, you go to infinity. The only small problem here is that uh, while, while this is well-defined, the limit of the U's doesn't exist except for differences. So for the U's, you have to take differences to get a limit. So this, so this is, this, this V of Z is defined in the upper half plane sort of as differences or in the same way full plane, full plane fields are. Fine. And the key thing, and here's an important fact that I want to say. So at a fixed time t, ut of z is determined by the curve up to time t. vt of z looks at the curve at time t and the residual field that was here. So if I, so if if this corresponds to this, there is, a, there is a independent field here on the entire real line. That independent field on the entire real line, I could, I could sample it out of those everywhere there. <clears throat> and then there's also 
the residual part here. And the residual part here is what's used in the VT of Z. So by the time we've done this, we still have a whole untapped field down here, independent. The same thing happens basically if you're in, in R. There's, this, there's, there's, this, uh, if you're in R, V is zero until you get, until you, until you have some imaginary part. There's nothing there, so you only have the U part contributing. So when you're on R, you're only you're only seeing the path on its route to get to get there. And again, there's there's a martingale there. So you know, I'll just I emphasize again. Let me do this. Uh, I make big jumps here for some reason. Uh, So at time t, we've explored the reverse SLE kappa only up to time t, and the residual field on the curve on the curve gamma t. Now there, there, there's a subtle dependence here because I've, I've observed only the residual field here, but the residual field on a piece of the curve that depends on what on, on this part here. But then the continuation has the distribution of the original original field. So this is sort of the zipping up. And if you wanted to do a stationary process, if you wanted to sort of go all the way up and get a stationary process, we could start with two two-sided Brownian motions and a little bit of extra things, so to fill uh, two extra GFFs. Um, and what we do is, we let BT produce a two-sided SLE kappa. Think of a two-sided SLE kappa as doing SLE kappa, and then the rest of it's gonna go up. Uh, BT star gives an independent field on the SLE kappa path. Um, and the positive values for BT are the curve that you see in the upper half plane. The positive values of BT star are the parts of the residual field of the curve you see in the upper half plane, and t less than zero is all this starting point going up again. And you get, and then you also do that. We also do that. You also say for capitals less than four, you have two pieces that haven't been touched, and there you have to put feet, independent fields. So this thing gives, gives you a natural stationary process. Um, but I want to discuss a little bit about exponentiating. So this is this will be well known to lots of people here. But I'll just say we're trying to you know random geometry. We're trying to find random conformable maps f. We think of that as trying to generate metrics. I wrote absolute f prime, but sometimes you want to look, want to look at the imaginary part as well. Sometimes you want to look at f prime. Yeah, and you write log f prime as log absolute f prime plus i argument. And you know, so the GFF is the log absolute f prime in this. So if you want to get f prime, you have to take e to the log f prime. So you have to exponentiate the GFF. So the GFF comes from stochastic integrals. That's what the GFF looks like. <clears throat> so when you exponentiate, you have, to, you have to take the exponentials of these but the exponentials of martingales are not martingales. You need to compensate in order to make it a martingale. So these are the corresponding exponential martingales. Um, and they're normalized so that times zero, they're equal to one. And then quantum length, quantum area, all these things are various kinds of limits of integrals of this over Z, where sometimes often the T I, I write this, but it, it's, it's pretty sloppy because the T you choose at a particular Z might depend on Z. It might it may not just be so. But, but they're all versions of your, your GFF and your GMC. Okay. 
For example, if you want to do the Gaussian free field restricted to the exponential Gaussian free field restricted to a curve, um, you, you have the curve. Um, and what you do is you look at this thing. This blows up uh, as you hit Z. So you choose a T naught depending on Z where this hasn't blown up yet. And then you normalize it and go like that. So have, um, many people have various versions of this. For instance, one of the standard one would be when the, you let time the first time that the formal radius looks is that e to the minus n. Okay. I mean, there are, there are various versions of this. Um, I'm not going to, okay. What I want to describe is the particular case of quantum boundary length for Neumann field. And so this is, dz is equal to this, vt is, is okay. Um, so we want to define the quantum boundary length of an interval, roughly speaking, and I'm not defining what this <laughs> wick product means. I just, I just mean this has to be normalized somehow. So L of Y should be uh, the integral from zero to Y, this. Uh, I have X dx. Um, for those who don't know, X is e to the log X. There's, your, there, there's log X singularities you often put in these things. There, there's your log x, there's your log singularity. Um, the fact that it's power one is the fact that I've chosen the right GFF for the right cap so that everything works out nicely. Okay, so, so to find it to be, so we wanted to find it to be a, a limit. So, so I go to, I, so this is what I want, want to define. I'm going to define a one stopped at time t and then define it to find that. Um, so LT of Y is, is the length of the is the length of zero Y. And I will say that this will be LT of Y will be defined pointwise, but the limit only up to multiplicative constant. So we can define the ratio of lengths of two things. And if these two guys are, are reached at the same time, then the length here and the length here will be the same. So I just want to throw a quick throw. At time t, this is an x in the real line. Um, I'm just going to, let me just go, go back to uh, the, the definition here. Okay, so. Uh, so yeah, I should, whoops. I just want to go back. So phi, phi is, the, is just equal to this. And now what I'm going to write, I'm going to write phi t of that. So I'll do this thing just integrated up to t. But I'm, but I'm going to write it as three parts. Um, I'm going to write it as the integral. So x is on the real line. So I'm going to integrate up to the time I reach the origin. And then I will integrate until the less of the time t. Let's assume the t is bigger than tx. We're about we're going to take little t to infinity. Uh, there is no h part when you're on the real line, but there is an h part once we've zipped up. And so the ex, the exponential of this is the well, it's just the exponential of those guys. Now, what I've left off of here are all the corrections needed to make these things martingales because I ran out of room on the line. But basically, this sum, we're looking at this thing. Okay, so that's why I said the right hand side need multiplicative compensators to make a local martingale. Um, okay, uh, and another comment for you is that, again, these are independent. Um, but these, these integrals are not independent, but because, the, because B and B star are independent, you can check that if I take the exponential martingale for this guy and the exponential martingale for this guy, the product of those is also an exponential martingale. 
the covariation term disappears. Yeah, okay. But now what I want to do is try to give an explanation of what these terms are doing. So the effect of the first exponential martingale is to change the variables in the integral from x dx to a multiple of capacity parameterization. So in this picture, uh, the, uh, the Bessel process with parameter minus a actually gives you a random measure on the real line, the measure of zero x being tx. Um, do, I, do I have the... oh, okay. Um, uh, by looking at the appropriate exponential martingale, you can formally write the integral from zero to y and dx x dx is integral zero to y, z at time t x x. So this is a formal, but one can make rigorous sense of this in the standard way that one does either uh, LQG, Minkowski content, and, and uh, so you can actually make sense of this and you actually get that what you've done is <coughs> change x dx into capacity parameterization. Uh, I have a grad student, Charlie Dublin, who speaks some of the details of these things. Okay. Now, in order to continue what's happening, I have to discuss Minkowski content a little bit. Uh, if I have an SLE kappa of pair, the capital S8 has fractal dimension D1 plus kappa over eight, but, um, and the Minkowski content is given as the limit as epsilon goes to zero. If, if you take, say, if a compact set, you fatten up the compact set by epsilon, uh, take its area, normalize it as you would, would for a d dimensional set, and take the limit. So it's known that the Minkowski content for SLE is well defined. And SLE capital path has the natural parameterization if it's parameterized by Minkowski content. Okay. Now, I say fact conjecture. This is something that Charlie's working out now how to get just to be check and be to be we're sure that it's true. But, uh, before uh, rigorous proofs of Minkowski content were made, there were various definitions for what the content should what it should be. And this is one of them, a limit of what I do is I take, I mean, what, what this picture is doing is taking a little piece here, um, and prime, so this, this, Uh, okay. When this little piece gets mapped someplace, the Minkowski content of this piece changes by the derivative. So it's, a, it's just a scaling rule, and it's the same kind of, a, but um, what expect, I mean, this, I'm sure this is true, even though, yeah. That's another way of getting it. Um, so Minkowski content is one way to have measures that, that uh, work conformally uh, covariantly. You could also take Minkowski kind of a standard thing. Other things you can do is multiply it by conformal radius to a power. Uh, or, if you, or if you have two boundary points, you could also multiply it by the sine of the angle to a power. Um, this, this acts covariantly, this acts invariantly. And so, but they're all, they're all basically absolutely contained with respect to Minkowski content. Uh, and you have, so Minkowski, so this measure 
scales, because the content scales, you need the derivative to the d power. If you have a conformal radius, that puts that that adds an alpha there. Uh, the the sign doesn't do anything. So the angle is a the formula barrier. Okay. So here is the the effect of the second exponential martingale is to change from capacity parameterization to a constant multiple of Minkowski contact. So I'll just, so here, so we started with an integral x dx. Doing this says, no, let's not do x dx. Let's do capacity parameterization. Doing this, here these are normalization says, no, I don't like predator, capacity parameterization. I'd rather do the Kosky content parameterization or a version of that. And this all has to do with the field. And then, um, I'll finally add that the effect of the third exponential martingale is to put an independent Gaussian field on gamma integrated with respect to this Minkowski content parameterization. So, um, I would say what's a little bit different here than other approaches to this is that other approaches start by looking at the field and somehow try to get everything out of that field. Here, we've naturally built up the field as of two different things. One thing drawing a curve and one thing putting an independent field on the curve. When we have that, when we start with that setup, then we can see what happens exponentiating it. So I don't, so, uh, I don't know if this is novel or not, or well, I think, okay, so, but, but this is how I now understand what's happening. And now I'll give Scott a chance to tell me I'm wrong. Uh, actually, I, I, I would, I'd like to use any, any time we have for discussion. So this is the first one. We have some time. Yeah. Maybe it's called the first answer. Great. <laughs> then we can ask other questions. Okay, so maybe back up and ask me exactly what your question is. Um, okay. <clears throat> I mean, I have only read some of your work in translation, i.e., Nathaniel's notes. Uh huh. And Things can get lost in translation. Okay. Um, but, okay, so you're trying to define quantum boundary length. Uh -huh. uh, so the x dx is just the logarithmic singularity. Okay, the, the x there. Um, do you see in your construction the one field written as the sum of the two fields? Here, I mean, I, I wrote the field. Let's see. Um, I mean, writing the field like this is necessary for me to understand the exponentiating of it. The field is so. Here's the here's the whole field, which has which is a has doubled the variance, but you get it, the double the, the variance, double the Green's function is because you have one thing producing a path and another thing producing a field on the path, combine them together and you, you get a field. You have a number of results of that type. Right. But I don't know whether you have that in this particular, for the, this sort of situation.
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, so if I if if you started with phi, uh -huh. could you find u and v? Okay, so so u and v. So this is. I mean, you, you, you know the end result in the sense that one way to construct things is to take a SLE and now put an independent field on that and average over both randomness. Uh -huh. And this is kind of another version of this, but it starts, but it's the <laughs> zipping up of something which is just on the real line and seeing where that's com coming from. See what part of the real line is given by the curve and what part by the independent field. Yeah, I mean, I guess there are always these two components so you're observing, you know, there's the difference between the field on the left and the field on the right. Right. It tells you whether you are zipping to the left or to the right as you zip up. And then there's always the sum of the two, which is sort of an independent a bit of noise. So if you imagine, you, have it, you know, you, you have your, your curve and you're, you're going to zip up a little bit. There's something on the left, something on the right. If those things are equal, then you're going to zip up in a straight line. But if the one on the right is a little bigger, then the field is denser over here. So you zip up sort of this way. Yeah. And but that is only telling you the difference as you go. There's also this sum parameter, which if you wanted to keep track of what the field is doing on the curve, you have to keep track of what the sum is doing also. And so you know, that may be the decomposition you're describing here. Um, but I, I'll just say in truth in advertising, um, what I do here cannot answer the question that I asked Scott in the sense that what I have not shown and personally, I'm not all that interested. That's is, I haven't shown that if you just gave me phi, everything here is measurable with just seeing phi. So I'm bypassing that construction. I'm just constructing phi this way so I can use those components. And sometimes one does ask questions about whether, and what you do actually looks at phi and kind of constructs it. I think these things are retro. I mean, but, but I, but my the, the construction here doesn't show the. Yeah. One thing I did learn in many of the constructions talk about the field, and then finding the SLE in the field. But then you go to the proofs, and you're starting with the SLE and then building the fields out of them. Yeah, that's right. It's sort of an indirect. And I'm being honest. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry with the yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, any other questions? Okay, that was. Okay. So I have a, a question about. So you mentioned that uh, that uh, uh, when uh, so when you uh, define the uh, on land. Uh, the quantum lens from like zero to x is the same as the quantum lens from like tx, like this like other point to uh, zero, right? Right. Uh, is this a uh, something like by your definition or something you prove or? that follows from it? This was a thing which was not clear in the original. Okay, that that is clear from this construction. Okay. Um, At least, uh, I think uh, one of the main points was proving that. It's not uh, Yeah, so let me just, yeah, let me, let me, and that's a good question, so let me. Because if this is clear, then uh, then the manageability is also like, just follow from maybe this one. Yeah, I, mean, I say this, this first exponential appropriately normalized changes 
things from uh, the XDX into um, capacity into capacity parameterization. Okay. <laughs> the values of the fields that are going to be seen are those going up, okay. and therefore. If, if, they, yeah. if, they, if, they, if they meet at that time of the capacity parameterization, everything else yeah. So I think that is kind of, I think that that's like, a, I mean, so in, I think in our original paper that I read, the last step is to prove these two latency. That's the very last. But this is like a, coming at the very first. So yeah, so this, this comes, 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 yeah. So maybe we can talk about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a curiosity if this can be extended to the multiple SLE simultaneous growth with the Dyson Brown in motion. Can you try to. Um, in the case, okay. I am ready to with another student, uh, Stephen Yearwood, the first, not the exponentiating, but the, but the Gaussian field part for multiple SLE. And it's basically the same formula. Um, and you get the same sort of because you just um, the multiple SLE. Okay, the multiple SLEs will the the uh, driving functions will have a drift term and a, and DBT terms. The DBT terms are the field that's being put on. When you're looking at the field someplace, it doesn't. It's not looking at the DT term. It's just looking at the field. The DT is just telling you. Is you doing something a little bit different with your information than you would do otherwise? And so, but in, in principle, if you take n of these yeah. quantum surfaces and you glue them all around, mm -hmm. then the um, you know you'll get n paths, and those paths will be these so-called SLE kappa row paths. Yeah. Um, you know, each one given the two to the left to right of it is just a regular SLE, and and if you try to generate these paths all at once, you could generate them using precisely this, this dice right. of emotions. So it is connected in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. But if you want to, you can start with dice of brownian motion, yes. define the field using the using the using the brownian motions of your dice and brownian, the, the independent DBT of your brownian motion. Then you have to write the Eno's formula to see that that gives you the boundary conditions. Of, of what you get, you get to, you to. and you could you could do if you if the SLEs are using the same point to dice and work, uh, you could also do it SLEs going to different points, and although we haven't written every detail, it's the same thing, but the equations not quite as aesthetic. Yeah, but yeah. Okay, so maybe we can save other questions after the second talk. So, uh, my son, uh, great. Yeah.